Hello, my name is Alex Kultikanolu, and I'll be talking about my research uh, bioremediation. I'm just giving a brief overview of what it is and how it works and what it's used for. So what is bioremediation? It is the use of either naturally occurring or deliberately introduced microorganisms or other forms of life to consume and break down environmental pollutants in order to clean up a polluted site. This is just a picture, uh, and we'll talk about where um, these pollutants come from and how they are removed from the environment. The biggest uh, pollutant, uh, mercury. It's a natural occurring element that is found in rocks in the Earth's crust and as a result of human activity. It exists in several forms, elemental mercury, uh, quicksilver in like thermometers, that's why your parents told you not to break thermometers, fluorescent light bulbs, uh, also found in inorganic mercury compounds, and the most toxic form, which is methylmercury. Um, it comes from geothermal activity, uh, such as volcanoes, weathering of rocks, which is the degradation of rocks through rain, uh, fossil fuel combustions, smelting activities, mining for mercury, gold, and other metals, and human activities have doubled or tripled the amount of mercury in the atmosphere. And the ab atmospheric burden is increasing by 1.5% per year. Um, So, it formed methylmercury, which is the most toxic form of, of, um, of mercury, forms when anaerobic bacteria react with mercury in water, soil, or plants. Um, the microorganisms combine mercury with carbon, thus converting it from inorganic to organic form. It cycles between the atmosphere, land, and water, and mercury undergoes a series of complex chemical and physical transformations. The most common organic mercury compound found in the environment, well, it's the most most common organic mercury compound found in the environment. It's highly toxic, and it's considered by the World Health uh, Organization as one of the top 10 chemicals or groups of chemicals of major public health concern. And methylmercury is more toxic than inorganic mercury. So these are six major steps in the mercury cycle. Um, the degassing of mercury from rocks, soils, and surfaces, surface waters, and or emissions from volcanoes and from human activities. So these are the human activities, fossil fuel burning, waste incinerators, uh, natural sources such as weathering um, of rocks, and the evaporation of, of mercury goes into the, um, to the atmosphere. Uh, so movement in gaseous form through the atmosphere, deposition of mercury on land and surface water, uh, and conversion of these so the position is the the when it rains onto the land and back into the water and then the conversion of the element into insoluble mercury sulfide which is very hard to get rid of um and and then it re-enters the atmosphere again and it then bioaccumulates in the food chain which basically means that uh, fish will eat the insoluble mercury sulfide or just methyl mercury or any, any mercury in general. And they'll eat more and more and more. And uh, that's why we're not allowed to eat tuna as much as often due to its methyl mercury content. It's, it's not a significant amount where it'll, it'll pose a health threat, but if we do eat a lot, 
it will um, it will there there are some concerns. Um, this is the aquatic mercury cycle. Is the ultimate source of mercury in most aquatic ecosystems is deposition from the atmosphere, primarily associated with rainfall. Atmospheric deposition contains three principal forms of mercury. Um, brought to sediments by particle settling and then later released by diffusion or resuspension. It enters the food chain so, or it can be released back into the atmosphere. The high, higher acidity and higher amounts of dissolved organic carbon enhance the mobility of mercury. So we know that um, water holds a lot of, uh, it, it's, water is a huge carbon bank. And the more, since we are producing more carbon every year due to uh, human activities, uh, methyl mercury is able to move through water easier. Because carbon makes carbon makes the water more acidic. Um, the process of accumulation of chemicals in an organism that takes place if the rate of intake exceeds the rate of excretion. So basically, more more methylmercury is coming in, and and less is coming coming out or disappearing overall. Um, and like I said, I talked about bioaccumulation. Um, animals low on the food chain consume phyto phytoplankton or bacteria, and these animals are consumed by larger predators, which results in even more accumulation of mercury in their tissues. Organisms take much longer to eliminate methylmercury out of their system. So these fish would eat um, phytoplankton or bacteria, and a lot of them, and then bigger fish will eat more of these fish and it's it's a huge chain reaction and at each step in the food chain the concentration of methyl mercury in the organism increases uh, the concentration of methyl mercury in the top level aquatic predators can reach a level million times higher than the level in the water which is absolutely crazy and now i'm going to talk about how we will so this is the bioaccumulation. Um, as you can see, methylmercury comes from volcanoes, a coal plant, maybe a mine. The runoff from the mine or the deposition or precipitation goes into the water. The krill, the krill, um, the krill eat the methylmercury, the little little particles of it, and then the salmon, pollock, or oyster uh, will eat the krill, trout or tuna will eat the salmon pollock or oyster and then sharks pikes albacore halibut would eat the trout tuna and uh yeah so this is why we can eat unlimited amounts of salmon pollock oyster and krill because the methyl mercury content is not enough for it to harm us um and then trout tuna we can't eat it as much because its methylmercury content is a lot higher and shark pike albacore halibut is actually only recommended to eat only a few times a month because the epa advises for consumption uh only a few times a month due to its uh, mercury level yeah so these are some health concerns um for all ages loss of peripheral peripheral visions Pins and needle feelings, lack of coordination of movements, impairment of speech, hearing, and walking, muscle weakness, effects on the nervous, nervous digestive, and immune systems, lungs and kidney. So people that are working in, in uh, gold mines and and people that are, don't have you know enough safety to um, to protect them from the effects of mercury are exposed the most. Um, unborn children, it impacts cognitive thinking, memory, attention, language, fine motor skills, and visual spatial awareness. I'll be going back to the miners because we know that some people in the world are being exploited and they are affected by, by methylmercury and it's, it's absolutely terrible.
So ways to reduce uh, the exposure to mercury is clean energy, um, meaning so we less we produce less uh, of you know fossil fuels, going back to using more solar, wind, geothermal, nuclear. So the the byproduct of methyl like of of uh, fossil fuel, which is sometimes methyl mercury or mercury in general won't be accumulated in the in the atmosphere or in our waters or in our land uh, stop the use of mercury in gold mining uh, eliminating the mining of mercury like replacing non-essential mercury containing products such as lamps and batteries and you know thermometers and of course bio remediation there's just some sites that mercury is being um, mine and it is polluting the area um as you see it's mostly in very it's a lot of countries that are very poor because people are allowed to exploit the workers in these terrible conditions with little to no pay so plants had their genes genetically modified util utilizing the recombinant dna technology such as crispr um and away is transgenic plants Transgenic plants have been infused with microbe-derived mercury metabolizing genes. Our one strategy is, is a strategy scientists have been exploring to tackle methylmercury in the environment. Um, people are concerned because some people do not um, trust GMOs because it's technically a GMO, a gen 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 genetically modified organism. Uh, but I think they're really, really highly important and we could use the power of biotechnology and DNA recombination to eliminate certain pollutants from the environment. So this is Indian mustard and it was actually used in the removal of cesium-137 from Chernobyl and uh, cesium-137 can, can lead to a high exposure a high exposure high exposure of cesium-137 can lead to risk of cancer and this this Indian mustard was genetically modified to um, to accumulate these and remove the these certain metals uh, such as cesium-137 from the Chernobyl site so we can you we can genetically modify certain plants and and make them remove this methyl mercury from the uh, atmosphere, the, the the water, and even the land. And that's just a brief overview. Um, there's much more to go into this, and I'm really happy that I'm doing research about this. So I hope you are fairly interested um, in in this process with and the journey that I'm about to take with uh, bioremediation. I'll be looking at more sites, possibly in New Jersey and around the world, and seeing what plants are, um, are, are, are needed to be planted and genetically modified in order to um, remove certain uh, pollutants in certain sites uh, that have been affecting um, other people and just the environment overall. So, thank you.